friends, and welcome to episode 4 of Wool and Word. My name is Susie. You can find me on Instagram under the username tidnit, like tidbit, but with knit. I am a knitter and seminarian living in Toronto, Ontario, and this is a knitting and theology podcast. If you're only interested in one or the other of knitting or theology, I have timestamps of everything down below. So you can um, check out whatever you want to check out and skip whatever you want to skip. I do want to share one thing at the top of the episode today that combines the two, which is um, very rare in my mind. It's kind of disjointed, this podcast sometimes, I find, because I do the knitting and then I skip to the theology and the two don't seem to have anything in common. But what I had forgotten and what my friend Catherine, who also goes to Wycliffe College where I attend, um, told me very recently, um, is that God is a knitter. (laughs) You know, people like freak out all the time about all the references in Harry Potter that leads one to believe that Dumbledore is a knitter. Um, But God, too, is a knitter. (laughs) And I think that's a bigger deal. And this conjecture is coming from a part in the Psalms. Um, I believe it's Psalm chapter 139. Um, And I wrote it down here so I don't mess it up. But it's, uh, it's the psalmist talking to God. And the psalmist says to God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. So God is a knitter. That's, uh, that's the overlap between theology and knitting today. <laughs> okay, so on to the knitting content. Um, I am wearing my finished object and I am so happy with it. Um, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to wear it for a while because as you can see, it's a shawl and it's quite a big shawl. Um, and it's been a, it's been summer, (laughs) but actually almost as soon as I finished it, the weather started cooling down. So it's pretty good timing, I think. Uh, this is the Vertices Unite by Stephen West. If you've been watching the podcast for a couple of weeks, you'll know that I've been working on it. Um, yeah, I finished it recently. Uh, let me undo it so I can show you. It's not going to fit in the camera. I just know it's not going to fit in the camera. See, it's, it's not going to, oh, maybe. There you go. That's how big it is. So it's sort of, I think it's bigger than my wingspan. Uh, but this is how it knit up to look like. Right over here, right over here. Um, I'll quickly go through all the yarns I used. Um, if you want me to do it slower, <laughs> I do it slower in other episodes. Um, but so the first yarn I started out with was Hedgehog Fibers. Moody Club, the first installment, and then it's striping with the Graphite by Riverside Studios. This is striping Titanium by Fiber for the People with um, pressed flowers by Lichen and Lace. And the last color is Olam Mills um, in the Utopia colorway. And after you do that um, last color, that's section three, I believe, you just use the other, like the colors you've already used for section four and then section five and the final section, section six is just a solid color. Um, And you, the, okay, so I thought I was gonna finish this. Like, so last week when I talked about it, I wasn't sure I was gonna finish it. And then as I got closer to the end, I was like, oh, I'm gonna be done in no time. But what I didn't realize, is that this is a very big shell. I knew that, but um, the part that didn't quite click in my head is that the whole thing is finished with this beautiful I-cord bind off. Right here. Um, This is done in the titanium colorway by Fiber for the People. Um, And doing an I-cord bind off around a shawl this big (laughs) takes a very long time. I did not expect it to take so long, um, but it took a very long time. Like, so I actually, I was curious about how long it would take because somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought it would be something crazy. Um, So I sat down and I started uh, picking up the stitches to set up the I-cord bind off around the perimeter of the shawl. Um, That was at 1 p.m. and I, finished the last like grafting together of the I-cord at around 9 p.m. So, and and like, obviously I stopped to eat and cook dinner, um, go to the bathroom and stuff like, it's not like I sat there knitting for eight hours straight, 
but it kind it, like I, it was pretty close to sitting there for knitting for eight hours straight to be able to do this I cord bind off. Um, I mean, admittedly, I'm a very slow knitter. I, uh, I do a lot of different things very slowly. Like, I'm a very slow reader as well, which might surprise some people, but I just, I do things slowly sometimes. And um, one of the things I do slowly, to my great disappointment, is knitting. <laughs> so I'm not very fast, but so the... My cord bind off took eight hours. Let's say it took eight hours because that, that's the time I clocked. Um, but I mean, the result, I mean, come on, like, look how good that looks. I think it looks so good in part because of the amazing color choices I made. <laughs> Not that I'm flattering myself or anything, um, but I just, I love how variegated the bind off is and I love how it's like a bright pop of, pop of color. Um, I think it really draws the whole thing together um, and uh, I'm really happy with it. So I'm gonna put it back on. Um, so the whole thing's done in fingering weight um, with US three, three millimeter needles. Um, I'm hoping it'll be uh, useful for me through the winter, but uh, you know, I'm not going anywhere this winter. All my classes are online, so I'm going to be at home anyway, but you know, it's, it's cozy. It's nice. Um, I really enjoy it. I'm very happy with it. And um, I got to finish it in time to enter it to two knit-alongs. Um, one's being run by Kevin and Ray at Needles at the Ready um, for the Let's Hear It for the Boys. Knit along, and uh, the grocery girls were also running a West along. Um, so I put in my posts on Ravelry uh, a couple of days ago. When I finished it, I don't, I can't keep track of time these days. <laughs> when I finished it, that's what I did. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this might be the most number of stitches I've put in on a project. I might just be thinking that because it feels really big and it might not be so big if it were like a garment that wraps around but it feels like a like a lot of stitches <laughs> um, so that was super um, satisfying and I'm very happy that it's done it was also very fun to knit up um, so this was finished very recently and it's also what I'm wearing as you can see so on to my works in progress um, Last week in my forecasting, I talked a big talk about how I'm going to um, cast on certain things <laughs> and work on certain things, um, but I haven't cast on those projects that I thought I would cast on uh, because uh, this lovely person I know through Instagram, she actually also lives in Toronto. Um, her name is Catherine and her Instagram handle is Catherine underscore this underscore life. She designed her first pattern. Um, and it looked really uh, adorable and wearable and she was looking for test knitters um, and I wanted to support her and also the garment looks great um, so I volunteered to test knit for her and so this came out of nowhere and um, she wants it done by a certain time obviously um, so I thought I would prioritize it a little bit um, and I cast that on pretty much immediately after I finished <laughs> this shawl. Uh, I've made good progress. It's called the it's called the wild lane top, and um, it calls for cotton. So it looks like this right now. It's color blocked, um, and you might recognize this colorway, the bottom colorway, uh, from last week or previous weeks because that's the colorway I knit my um, other test knit with. It's the copper by We Are Knitters in the Pima cotton. Um, and this is the mauve colorway, also the We Are Knitters Pima Cotton. Um, Catherine didn't use We Are Knitters, but it's just, she calls for cotton, um, and that's the We Are Knitters cotton is the cotton I had lying around. And anyway, I had a big chunk of this color left from um, my last knit, and I thought it looks really, I don't know, I think it looks good with the uh, mauve. Um, they're both sort of warm tone. No, they're not both warm tones. <laughs> I don't I don't know anything about colors I just sort of look at them and I think oh that looks nice or oh that doesn't look nice 
I, the color theory, I, don't, I did really badly in art in school when they made you take art. I dropped it as soon as I was allowed to. <laughs> but here I am, uh, regretting that, wishing I knew more about color, but my sense is this looks okay together. Yeah. I don't know. I think it looks good. It's knitting up super fast um, because it's uh, with US 8 needles, 5 millimeters. Um, and uh, there's some texture at the bottom hem. You can see like a slip stitch texture. But the mauve bit has been all stockinette so far. And then um, the going forward, there's going to be a lace pattern, which I'm really excited about. It looks really cute. Um, I'll put a picture of her finished um, object of the pattern right over here, so you can see what the lace is going to look like. Um, so yeah, uh, it's as you can see, it's uh, bottom-up construction in the round. I actually just split for the armholes, um, so I'm working flat now, which means purling, but it's okay. I don't mind purling. I don't know why people... No, I know why people get so upset about purling. It's kind of annoying, but I don't mind it. Um, so I'm excited about this, um, not only because I get to support someone in Toronto, um, someone who's starting out designing, also because it's going to be really super wearable and nice. And also I was thinking about this and I was wondering why I'm still so fixated on like summer knits when September is here. September is here. And I realized, like I said before, I'm going to be sitting at home like all winter. So I can wear summer knits all winter. Um, so I'm going to keep knitting summer knits. I mean, I'm also going to keep knitting. I'm going to start on my fall knitting soon. Um, we'll talk about that later. But um, I feel very liberated after having realized that, knowing that I can keep knitting summer knits and keep wearing them around the house. <laughs> so that's very exciting for me. Um, that's a hot tip for you. Keep knitting summer knits. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so that's all I have to say about the Wild Lane top. I'm hoping it'll be done by next week and I'll be wearing it because, again, like I said, it's flying off my needles um, and the color blocking is just so much fun. Uh, next up on my works in progress list is the Longfellow cardigan. Um, it's going to look like I haven't done any work on it since last week, maybe, because uh, I haven't really started the sleeves yet and that's what I said last week too. <laughs> But I, I've actually put in a substantial amount of work on this. Um, let me show it to you and then I'll explain. See, now it actually, you know what, I'm going to put it on. It's put onable now. That's uh, how much work I did on it. See? So by, by uh, what I mean by that I put in work on it is, one, I seamed it up, so because last time I, only the shoulders were seamed up, so I seamed up the sides. Um, I also wove in all the ends. There were like a billion ends dangling, and that took forever. Um, but the thing that took the longest was picking up all these stitches and putting in a button band. Um, because as you can see, this, the body is going this way, but the button band is going this way. And I also sewed in some buttons. I love these buttons. I'm so happy with these buttons. I'm not a great sewist, so don't judge me about my sewing. By what I mean when I say I'm not a great sewist is that I am a very bad sewist. <laughs> I know how to get the thread through the needle. That's about it. Um, but these buttons I got from a uh, unit. They're um, Japanese mother of pearl buttons. Um, I'm really excited about how they look on this. Um, but so the button band, did I say already that this is a Longfellow cardigan? Because it is a Longfellow cardigan um, by Brooklyn Tweed, um, designed by Michelle Wong. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and this is knit in a knit crate yarn called La Brebis, which is 100% baby alpaca in the ancient pines colorway. So back to the button band talk. Um, what you do is, so you seam up the shoulders and then 
you pick up from one of the side pieces, you pick up stitches from one of the side pieces, and you go all the way around like this. So I think by the end of it, I had like close to 400 stitches on the needles, um, which is a lot of stitches. <laughs> so to even to do like, I think this turned out to be like six rows, even doing six rows, that was a lot of stitches. Um, and there were tiny needles. <laughs> they were, um, what size needles were they? They were three millimeter needles, which aren't, you know, super tiny, but they felt very tiny when I was knitting with them. <laughs> um, and uh, the pattern calls for, uh, uh, what does it call for? Um, tubular bind off. And I just didn't do a tubular bind off. Over 400 stitches. I think it looks fine. I really, I mean, it's not that, so this is for my boyfriend. It's not that I don't love him enough to do a tubular bind off for him. If I thought the tubular bind off looked way better than just a regular bind off, I would totally do a 400 stitch tubular bind off for my boyfriend. I really would. But I, uh, to be completely honest with you, <laughs> like, this is probably partly why I didn't do so well in art classes because I'm not very detail oriented. Um, I can't really, like I can tell the difference between a similar bind off and a regular bind off. Like I know they look different. Um, but the, like the differential of like quality increase versus like amount of time and effort it takes, I just find it's not really logical. <laughs> So that's, a, that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it, and I didn't do the tubular bind off, and I have no regrets. I'm very happy, actually, that I didn't do the tubular bind off, because it looks great, it looks fine, it, you know, like, and no one's, no one's going up to, no one's coming up, like, this close. It won't even focus, anyway, so why does it even matter? It doesn't even matter. <laughs> um, so that's, that's my second work in progress that I worked really hard on this week. Um, like I said, I know it doesn't look like much because it's still just a vest and the sleeves are missing. Um, but I like weaving in ends takes way longer than you'd think it would take. So that's, uh, those are my works in progress. Um, and that's uh, it for the knitting portion for now. We're going to move on to the theology portion and I'm just going to warn you, it's going to be a little bit garbled because I'm not working on anything specific um, and I just have a bunch of thoughts that I wanted to throw out there and see what you guys thought. So all this goes back to maybe yesterday. I think it was yesterday. I was talking to Joe Mangina who is the professor of systematic theology at Wycliffe College and he's working on a book um, based around the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. And he's interested in the temple, the church, um, yeah, and stuff like that. Um, so I was talking to him and I went on my whole recent crusade, which you'll be familiar with if you saw last week's episode, about how important it is for all of us to partake in the Eucharist together and break bread. And um, Dr. Mangina, ever the <laughs> uh, intellectual adversary, <laughs> Asked me, well, 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 where does that put, you know, the Catholic Church who um, believe that, uh, like, if they allow communion with Protestant, like, baptized people, it would cheapen the Lord's Supper because um, they're, we're sharing in one bread even though we are divided doctrinally. And I, I sort of said something like, you know, I think that's kind of backwards. It's like putting the chicken before the cart or the... Yeah, I did this. I messed up the idiom when I was talking to him too. But it's like egg before chicken, cart before horse. Yeah, it's like putting the cart before the horse. Oy vey. Um, the point is that if we break bread together first, then unity will follow. That's sort of what I said. And then him again ever so helpful in trying to get me on my intellectual toes, asked me, what would you do if you were an ordained minister 
and you knew that someone walked in um, to partake in communion and this person was a white nationalist. And I like to think that I answered without skipping a beat, but I did definitely skip a beat. But eventually I said I would definitely be okay with him taking communion or her taking communion, um, even if they're white nationalists. And I mean, well, yeah, yeah, I'm sticking by that. Um, so I was sort of trying to convince him, because <laughs> he's working on church unity right now, his chapter um, that he's working on right now. Uh, he has to talk about ecumenism and church unity. Um, I was trying to convince him that the solution to all of our problems is to just get together and worship together, <laughs> which I realize is very simplistic, but that's what I really believe. Um, but the lines he's been thinking along, and the lines I was pursuing a while back, um, and I think it's ultimately the same line that I'm advocating for, but anyway, that's for another day. He's been thinking a lot about martyrdom, uh, and he told me about an article his colleague and our old friend, Dr. Ephraim Radner, wrote, um, about martyrdom, and he, one of the points he makes is that there are places in the world where they don't ask you if you're Catholic, if you're Protestant, if you're, ba um, if you're Baptist, or if you're Pentecostal. They just ask you if you're baptized, and if you're baptized, you're killed. <laughs> and that's the basis of Christian unity. Yikes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you know, that like, People say, people used to say anyway, that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. So it makes sense in a way. Um, but I think part of the problem with that kind of talk about martyrdom is that um, it's tied to another problem that we have as modern people. Sort of death is very far away from us. It used to be that, you know, people would die a lot and they would die in their homes and children would see their dead parents or dead grandparents and there would be a lot of contact with death but these days death has sort of been um, what's the word like it's been secluded to very specific places and I don't think any of us can even fathom what it means to die for one's faith like it's even the phrase sounds antiquated and quaint die for one's faith. Um, I mean, it does to me as a sort of privileged North American person that's never ever been persecuted for my Christianity. Um, and I'm assuming that's most of my audience here. So, um, so I think an easier way or like a more approachable way of thinking about martyrdom for people like us might be to think about how we can metaphorically die to ourselves. Um, like, sacrifice ourselves for the sake of others. Like, how do we die f in order to love others? I mean, we can't really. There's no way to do that for us, people like us. Um, so maybe we have to be a little bit more imaginative and creative and thinking about it. and. This sort of brings me back to um, Dr. Mangina's whole thing about, you know, what would you do if a white nationalist walked in? What would it mean for me in that situation um, to be a martyr, to lay my own life down um, for the sake of loving this person whom I disagree with, but who is nevertheless um, fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image? Um, that's a quote from the psalm, actually, the, <laughs> uh, the same psalm that um, I talked about earlier uh, with the God knitting us <laughs> in our mother's wombs. Um, but so anyway, so what, like, what does it mean to die to these people? What does it mean to die to myself? What does it mean to nail to the cross my ideas about what's right and what's wrong and my ideas about what I think is happening in the world and um, you know and even while talking about this like I can see I can feel the old not the old me but 
I can feel a part of me rebelling against this idea because I think like what good is it going to do if I um, crucify my ideals of what's right and what's wrong to the cross um, because like surely my ethics are better than the white nationalist ethics so it isn't aren't I just creating room for the white nationalist to get his or her way if I acquiesce to nailing my ideas about how white supremacy is wrong to the cross. So it's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything, if you haven't noticed. Um, but this sort of reminded me of an article I kind of skimmed um, about uh, like conspiracy theories going around these days. I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't want to like give people ideas about what rabbit holes to fall into. But basically, it was an article about how lots of Christians these days are falling prey to conspiracy theories. And I think it's because um, churches have ceased to provide a sense of meaning for Christians. I think it's because churches never really succeeded in giving Christians anything substantial to live by. So in the vacuum of sort of like physical community that you get at churches, Lots of people have turned to the internet where um, there are tons of crazy ideas going around. Um, but these conspiracy theories, the thing about conspiracy theories is that they make the world kind of make sense, um, which means that they give people a sense of meaning and they give people a sense of purpose, which apparently Christianity is no longer able to do. Um, and it makes me really sad to think that like a lot of Christians, you know, down in the South or even in Canada are so hungry for meaning um, that they're buying into these ideas about how masks are killing you and all that stuff like that. And I've been wondering a lot about what it is I can do. Um, what what can I do? How like and is it any good for me to continually try to you know be a martyr? Um, and lessen myself and lower myself. And it's interesting too, right? I mean, this is the last thing I'm going to say. Um, it's interesting to me that the word martyr has in modern times gotten a kind of negative tone. Like people will say, oh, you're such a martyr. Don't, don't play the martyr. Um, and I'm well aware of that. So uh, I know that it's not super attractive to talk about martyrdom, <laughs> um, but that's what I've been thinking about, so, yeah. Okay, on to the verse of the day. Um, so, verse of the day is a kind of silly portion that I do where I um, pull up my Bible app on my phone, um, and this app gives you a verse of the day. <laughs> it's random, it's just one verse, which is problematic, but you know, it's better than nothing. And I just read it to you and I talk about it. Um, so I always read it in the King James Version, and today's verse of the day is Proverbs 3, 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Is it just me or does that have a lot to do with what I was just talking about? I didn't plan this. I like the verse is random and I don't look at it before I start filming. So, be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. It really... This is hard to do as someone that's studying theology and someone who spends a lot of time talking to a lot of great theologians um, and who maybe might do advanced studies in theology. It's easy for me, honestly, to feel like I know stuff. <laughs> um, I, there's no in-between with me. Either I'm feeling like I know all of the things or I feel like I know none of the things. Um, and sometimes it's it's, it's kind of, it's, it's very dangerous when I get into my I know all of the things moods. Um, I really need to try to actively stop that from happening. 
Um, because, you know, Proverbs. It just said, I lean not, or what does it say? Be not wise in thine own eyes. You know, it's better to think of yourself as kind of foolish and clueless. <laughs> Um, than to think that you have all the answers. Um, because ultimately, I mean, if you're Christian, um, or if you believe in a God, the whole point of believing in a God is that they know better than you. <laughs> um, and I think that's what the fear of the Lord piece, uh, that's where the fear of the Lord piece comes in. Um, it's not a popular concept these days to talk about a God that ought to be feared, but I mean, just like a quick think about what it is to believe in a God that created everything. Like, of course you're going to be afraid. <laughs> Why wouldn't you be afraid? Um, it just puts into perspective how uh, created we all are. And I don't want to get on a whole other <laughs> track of thought about power, which is something I've also been thinking about. Um, but basically, being a created being means that we're not as powerful as the thing that created us. So, um, and when there's a power differential, obviously there's going to be, have to be, some amount of fear. And that's just the rightful posture um, that should be taken. Oh boy, there's a lot of things I want to say about that um, with regards to people feeling powerless and relying on violence. Um, and rising up, um, not being fearful. I think there's a context in which those things are very good. Um, I'm not going to get into that now. I think it's too complicated, but I'll just, um, yeah, I'm not going to get into that now. Um, it is on my radar. Maybe I'll talk about it some other time. Um, what I'm talking about specifically is all the rioting and violence and looting that's happening in the States. Um, and the response that the Democrats have given to it, and the response that the Republicans have given to it, and how scary that all is. So maybe I'll talk about that sometime, but that's not really theology, that's politics. So maybe I won't talk about it. I don't know, we'll see. <sighs> okay, so, man, that's it for the theology content um, until I tell you very shortly what I'm gonna try to work on over the next week after what I tell you, I wanna, after telling you the knitting I'm going to work on. So for the um, stash enhancement slash forecasting section of the podcast, uh, the first thing I'm going to say is at the very top of my list after the test knit I'm doing for Catherine, um, which is my priority, the very top of my list is um, a project I have to finish by September 20th-ish. Um, I mentioned them on episode one, I think. I was in the process of knitting a pair of socks for my aunt who lives in Korea. I finished one sock and fell into a very, very deep second sock syndrome. But my mom is going to Korea um, sometime in late September and I want to send along the socks with her so I have to get it done by then. So I keep thinking to myself that I will get these socks done. Um, and I think I have just to show you briefly, this is this is the finished first sock. I just have to do a second one. It's like cast on and everything, and I just refuse to work on it, but I think I'm going to start on it the second pair. No, not the second pair. I always mess this up. The second sock of the pair. <laughs> um, as soon as I finish recording, I'm going to get on to those socks. Um, the other thing I want to start really soon is the Hohe Fall Cal. I actually posted a kind of survey on my Instagram, um, which is Tidnit, T-I-D-N-I, no, K-N-I-T, um, about what I'm, like, I'm between two projects. Um, I'm hoping to get both of them done within the span of the knit along, but that might not happen, so it seems pretty important to pick which one I want to really work on. And, um, it was between the boxy, which everyone loves, so that was obvious, that was more popular. Um, but, and, and I feel like I should do the thing that got more votes, because that's sort of what I led people to think was going to happen. Votes as in likes. Um, but my heart is kind of in the other option that not a lot of people seemed really into. 
Um, it's called Spectre. I'll put a picture here. Um, and uh, this is also my stash enhancement, but it's a it's like a faded pullover. And um, I don't have all the colors out, but I was in the um, Moody Fade Club for June, July, and August by Hedgehog Fibers. And this is my August. So I was thinking I would sort of it would sort of go down like this and I would pick the darker one from my July uh, set of fades and then I would do because I think it's a four skein project. Um, so that's actually what I really want to cast on. Um, and September is here, so I should really pick and cake up some yarn and cast it on. But I have not succeeded in doing that. Um, this took a long time. And the weaving in the ends on the cardigan also took a long time. Uh, which is, which brings me to my next point, which is that last week I said I was going to start Stephen Chester's book. I did not start Stephen Chester's book. So the forecasting for this week is going to be I actually will start Professor Stephen Chester's book. Um, maybe. Yeah. Well, you know, so that's all for today. Um, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next week. Bye.